Welcome back to our ongoing series of videos on the analysis of parallel cord trusses. This particular video is based on Chapter 7, Section 1, Subsection 8, in which we will focus on the analysis of a 24 square bay truss with equal 5 bay cantilevers at each end. This first slide shows half of the truss. There's a support point here. This is the symmetry line of the truss. So basically we see this same thing mirrored over on the other side. Here are the five cantilevered bays and then seven of the, four of the bays, uh, the 14 bays between the support points. You'll notice in the pattern we've set the diagonals in the cantilever in this direction so that they are working in tension. And then on the other side of the support point between the supports we've run the diagonals in the opposite direction so that they are also working in tension. We're assuming this is a steel truss. We would prefer to have the long members working in tension because as we mentioned before, steel is a very strong material Typically, we don't need very much material in the cross section. Uh, as a consequence, steel tends to uh, be vulnerable to buckling because, ironically, because the material has such a high stress capacity, um, we don't need very much of it in the cross section. The cross section tends to be small, and as a consequence, in compression, tends to be vulnerable to compression. So, we're trying to keep the compression members as short as possible. So, for example, all these vertical members, which are the short members, are working in compression, and the diagonals, which are the long members, are working in tension when we configure the truss in this way. Now we're going to zoom in a little bit uh, to make it all more readable. So we're going to start looking at the cantilever, and uh, we're going to begin right here because this is one of the few points where we really have enough information in order to solve the entire joint. So this is joint A. It has an applied load of 0.5p downward. Uh, in order to keep that joint in equilibrium, this member must be pushing up on that with a 0.5p force. Um, that means the joint is pushing back down on the member. The member is in compression. Its equilibrium requires that the joint B be pushing up on it. And then by action-reaction pairs, that means the member is pushing down on joint B. So one way of looking at it is that, uh, as we have mentioned several times, the members being two force members are more or less passing forces through. So the force here has basically been transmitted down through this little column to this joint right here. So we're expressing an upward force on joint A due to the member, a downward force on joint B due to the member. They are in turn pushing back on the member and putting it in a state of compression which we're indicating with this C, and the magnitude of that force is 0.5P. Now, we need to continue on with joint A to resolve what's happening with this member. It's clear that joint A has no applied forces in the horizontal direction. If this member were applying a force, it would cause point A or joint A to be unstable or to start moving. So clearly, that member has got to be a zero force member and we designate that in this way. And sometimes I'll draw a little line along here. I guess I was not consistent in this case, but I'll put a line there to indicate that we have addressed the issues of equilibrium at this joint, and we've addressed the impact of this member on that joint. Um, but as long as we understand this is a zero force member, when we get to this joint, we will basically ignore the presence of this member because it's not contributing anything to the horizontal forces that are occurring at joint C. So now we can jump down to joint B, and we basically uh, see that we have a half P downward force. The only member that can equilibrate that is this diagonal, which must have a 0.5 upward force um, or upward component. So we draw the force along that length, and in this bookkeeping system, we put a 0.5 here to, to uh, indicate the magnitude of the vertical component. Uh, by the nature of the geometry of this diagonal, since it's at 45 degrees, uh, the horizontal and the vertical components have to be equal in magnitude 
in order to create a force along the length of that member. And of course we can use the Pythagorean theorem or trigonometry to resolve what the total force in member B C is in its point 0.71 P and that member is in tension because that has to be the case. It couldn't pull up on the joint B if it was not in tension. And joint B is pulling down to the left on the member. Joint C is pulling up and to the right, which is creating the state of tension in that member. So now we need to resolve the horizontal forces here, and that's pretty simple to do. We had a 0.5p component uh, in the horizontal direction from this diagonal, and that's the only horizontal force so far that we've identified on joint B. So this member, BD, must be pushing to the left on the joint, and it's in turn pushing to the right on joint D. So now we've completely resolved joint B. We could jump to D, but we don't have enough information because we have two unknown verticals and two unknown horizontals. So we're going to jump up to joint C instead. When we do that, we see that we have uh, two verticals. One is the supplied force of 1P, and then there's a downward vertical component from this diagonal of 0.5. So that's a total of 1.5P pulling downward on C. The only member that can equilibrate that is member CD, which must be pushing up on joint C with a 1.5P force. So uh, basically that's this force right here, and we jumped uh, an image here, and we're going to completely resolve the joint by saying that the horizontal component of this diagonal is being balanced by a pull due to this member, and the 1.5P downward force due to the diagonal and the applied force is being equilibrated by this member, which is pushing up with 1.5P and that completely resolves all the forces on joint C. Now we can jump down to joint D. The vertical component, that 1.5P downward on joint D due to this vertical member has to be equilibrated by the vertical component of that member. And so it has to be pulling up with 1.5P. To be along the diagonal, it also has to be pulling to the right with 1.5P. And the Pythagorean theorem says that the overall um, uh, force in that member is 2.12p and it's in tension. Now we need to resolve the horizontals here. We have um, a, and there's an arrow missing here, there should have been an arrow to the right of 0.5p and likewise uh, we have a 1.5p from here due to the horizontal component of that diagonal so this member has to be pushing back on that joint with a 2P force. So that takes care of the resolution of this joint and now we can jump up to E and we see that we have a 1.5P vertical component from the diagonal. We have a 1P applied force so this member has to be pushing up with a two and a half P force in order to equilibrate that. So we draw that in. It must be pushing down on this joint also um, with a two and a half P force. So we indicate that with this arrow. Now we need to resolve this member. We have a 0.5 P force to the left due to the uh, tension in this top cord pulling to the left on joint E. The diagonal is also pulling to the left with a 1.5p horizontal component. Um, so the diagonal and the cord are conspiring together to produce a 2p force to the left on joint E, and this member has to be pulling to the right with a 2p force. So we draw that in, and now we've taken care of all the equilibrium on this joint. We can jump down to this one. We see this 2.5p downward force uh, on joint F has to be equilibrated by the diagonal which has to be pulling up and to the right and so we draw those forces in uh, so this two and a half P force is being equilibrated by the vertical component of this diagonal. Now we can resolve the horizontal forces we have a 2P force pushing to the right due to this member right here pushing to the right on joint F 
And then joint F is also being pulled to the right with a two and a half P force uh, from this diagonal. So that adds up to four and a half P. And the only member that can equilibrate that is this one right here. So it has to be pushing to the left with a four and a half P force. And that means it's also pushing to the right with a four and a half P force on joint H. Now we can jump up to joint G and resolve the forces there. With the vertical, we have 1P applied force, 2.5P uh, vertical downward force from the diagonal. So 1P plus 2.5P both downward is 3.5P. This member is the only member that can equilibrate that. It must be pushing up with a 3.5P force. So we will indicate that with the arrow upward on joint G and an arrow, arrow downward on joint H. The magnitude of that force is 3.5P and the member can't be pushing unless something's pushing back on it. So it's in a state of compression. Now we can finish off joint G by looking at the horizontal components. We have a 2.5P horizontal component to the left from the diagonal, a 2P a horizontal force from the cord member, both of those to the left on joint G, so this member has to be pulling to the right with a 4.5P force. So we indicate that arrow pulling to the right on joint G, the member has to be pulling to the left on joint I, and this member is in tension with a magnitude of 4.5P. Now we can jump down and resolve the vertical forces at this joint. We have a 3.5P downward force, this diagonal is the only member that can equilibrate that. It must be pulling up with a vertical component of 3.5 P. So when we throw that in, we see a diagonal force along here, um, upward and to the right with a 3.5 P vertical component and a 3.5 P horizontal component to keep it along the diagonal. And the Pythagorean theorem tells us that the total tension in that member has to be 4.95 P. Now to finish off uh, this joint, we've apparently uh, jumped another image here also, but we have a 4.5P force on joint H to the right due to the push of this bottom cord. We have a 3.5P horizontal component to the right due to the tug or the pull of this diagonal. Those two things add together to give us an 8P force, and the only member that can equilibrate it is this member which has to be pushing to the left with an 8P force. We've now resolved this entire joint. We can jump up to joint I, and again we have a 1P downward applied force, a 3.5P downward component due to the diagonal, which is pulling down and to the left. Those add up to 4.5P. This is the only member that can equilibrate that, so we draw that member in. While we're about it, we just went ahead and drew in the horizontal resolution because we have this member pulling to the left with 4.5p, this member pulling to the left with 3.5p, which adds up to 8p, and the only member that can equilibrate that is this cord member, which has to be pulling to the right with an 8p force. Now we can go resolve the components here. Um, there's a 4.5p downward force. The diagonal has to be pulling up with a 4.5p force and it has to be pulling to the right with a 4.5p force to keep the force along the diagonal. So we can draw that in, and while we're about it, we also threw in the horizontal resolution, which was um, we have 8p to the right uh, from this member pushing to the right on joint G. This member on the diagonal is pulling to the right with a 4.5p, and, and when we add 8 and 4.5, we get 12.5p. Now, we cannot jump up to this joint because we don't have enough information, but this joint is really easy to do. We only have one horizontal member that can equilibrate this push to the right of 12.5p, and that's this member right here, and we only have one vertical member that can equilibrate this 12p force, and so that 12p force has to be generated by a downward force from this member and then this force will be equilibrated by a 12 and a half P push to the left. So joints like this, we immediately could have started with this joint because we knew that these two horizontals had to balance each other. Well, excuse me, we knew these, these vertical forces had to resolve in this way, 
but until we'd gone all the way through solving this, we didn't know what the horizontal components would be. We knew they had to be equal to each other by the nature of the geometry of what's going on at this joint, but we didn't know that this was 12 and a half P until we had stepped our way through the entire truss. So now we've resolved this joint, we can resolve the vertical components up here. We have a 1P downward force, a 4.5P uh, downward force, and a 12P upward force. So if I'm doing my arithmetic right, that should be a 6.5P net upward force. Because we got 5.5P down and we got 12 up. And so when we go resolve that joint, we get a 6.5p vertical component, and by geometry, the horizontal has to be the same. And now we can resolve this member right here. We have 8p to the left and 4.5p to the left, which gives us 12.5p if I'm doing my arithmetic to the left. But then we've got 6.5p to the right, so 12.5 minus 6.5 leaves us with a net required force of 6p to the right. So let's do that one more time. We got 8p and 4.5p to the left. We got a 6.5p to the right. That leaves us with a net of 6p to the left. So this member has to be pulling to the right on this joint with a 6p force. Now we can jump down and resolve this joint. Uh, we have a 6.5p upward force from this diagonal. This member has to be pushing down with that. And horizontal force wise, we've got 12.5p to the right, 6.5p to the left, which leaves us with a need for a 6p force to the left, which can only be exerted by this member pushing to the left on that joint. So we put that 6p force in. And now we jump up to this joint, we resolve the verticals, uh, 6.5p up, 1p down, so that's a net 5.5p up. This diagonal has to work in tension to equilibrate that, so it's pulling down with a 5.5p force. And then by geometry, we know that the vertical and the horizontal have to be the same. So now we can jump to this member, and we see that it's 5.5p to the right, 6p to the left, that leaves a half a p force to the left. So this member must be pulling to the right with a half a p force, and we draw it in like that. Now this is a very small force, and actually in some members, for some geometries, we'll actually have everything working out perfectly where we have a zero force member here. But in this case, that's not exactly uh, the situation. But what we did was we had a rapid buildup of tensile force, and then once we pass over the support, we start throwing in a compressive components that equilibrate some of that, and so the tensile force is going down, and by the time we get to the next bay, it will actually be compressive force. And uh, let's see if we're showing that. So here, here we're showing um, up through bay Q. So we got M and Q, and then to get it all in readable form in this image, we've repeated M and Q here. So this 0.5p segment is that one right there. And this is where we make the transition that we're going from tension now to compression all the way through the center. Now, one of the things I want you to note is that the 12.5p compressive force on the bottom here is almost equal to the 12p compressive force in the middle. And so we are very close to a, an almost optimal solution uh, in terms of the cantilevers in that the, that the uh, compressive force on the bottom here is about equal to the compressive force on the top there, which is that sort of balanced situation that we were looking for where we slid the supports in to the optimal location so that the moment at the center is equal roughly to the moment of the supports. We're not perfectly there and we can't get perfectly there because it's inherent in the nature of trusses that these supports have to occur on vertices here. And it would turn out that the absolute optimal point would just be slightly to the, to the um, left of this vertex 
but we don't support trusses in that way. So it just turns out that five, uh, two five bay trusses uh, in a truss with an overall length of 24 bays is very close to the optimal cantilever. All right, so we can now um, express what that might look like in graphic form. Um, here we have a simple span truss with huge cord forces. As we begin to slide the supports in, the cord forces get smaller and we start to get minute uh, negative uh, or reverse cord forces over the support. So we have compression here on the top and compression here on the bottom. And what we're looking at there, by the way, is, um, is the optimal kind of situation here where we're five bays in. We got a five bay cantilever here, a five bay cantilever there, 14 bays in between. And our cord forces in compression on the bottom here about match the cord forces in compression on the top there. If we keep going and we slide it into six bays, we are at that point where we have 12 bays that are balanced over this support, 12 bays that are balanced over that support, and we essentially have zero cord forces at the center, at least in the top here. So these two bays are zero cord force, that bay is zero cord force, and that one is also on the top cord. And of course, if we keep sliding them in, we end up with a situation where the cord forces are as bad for these cantilevers as they are for um, the simple span. Uh, Deflection-wise, we see uh, similar pretty dramatic results. Our optimal situation has almost no deflection at the ends of the cantilevers. Uh, we have very large deflection for the full simple span, very large deflection for the cantilever situation where we have um, the full maximum potential uh, cantilever. So this solution right here is optimal both in terms of minimizing cord forces but also minimizing movement out near the ends of the truss. Now uh, sometimes we're not sort of uh, dealing with a situation uh, like this where we're saying let's play games with sliding the supports in. Sometimes we don't have that option. Maybe we needed a space this size but there are other ways to play this game and one of them is we can say well we need this size space and we might want some cantilevers out here you know this might be a loading dock for something or a place to park cars or uh, some kind of covered canopy for the outside so the, an interesting question becomes do we want to start adding cantilevers out here and of course your first thought is well we add a cantilever and that costs money but an interesting thing is if you add enough cantilever you can very substantially reduce the loads that occur between the supports. so instead of this very large uh, force in the cord member we have something substantially smaller so we can have material savings on the structure between the support that can help pay for part of this cantilever and we may decide that that's something we want to do again we have this situation where the sort of optimal cantilever which is which is down at the bottom in this case where this force and that force are about equal is the situation where we're getting the least movement out at the end of the cantilever. Now I mentioned earlier that we can't um, we can never get the optimal cantilever in a truss because the truss is kind of a quantum system where we're going to support at a joint and that means the cantilever is either one, two, three, four, five, six bays, but it's not 5.87 bays. But what we can do is we can look at uh, this whole idea from a point of view of what might the optimal be. So uh, in this column, what I've written up is um, N, which is the total number of bays in the truss, and I just went linearly from 10 down to 44 and then I put in 0.29 times n because that would be the optimal single cantilever and 0.207 n um, and basically I'm looking for uh, something that approximates integer numbers so 
for example, let's take a bad case. If we had a 12 bay truss and we wanted to have a single uh, cantilever that was optimal, if I just multiply 0.29 times 12, it tells me that the optimum is 3.48 bays. But we know we're not going to support 3.48 bays in the cantilever. It's either going to be 3 or 4. So we don't have an optimal single cantilever or anything close to it for a 12 bay truss. And we've got similar problems over here for a 12 bay truss with two cantilevers because when we multiply 0 0.207 times n, where n is 12, we get 2.48 bays is optimal which is about two and a half bays, but we don't support it like that, so we'd have to choose either two or three. But we run this number of bays from 10 to 44, and then we multiply 0.29 times that, and we get a bunch of numbers here. And then we multiply 0.207 times that, and we get a bunch of numbers here. And then we look for anything that's close to an integer. So for example, 4.06 is fairly close to an integer, so we might say, well, a 14-bay truss with a 4-bay cantilever is not too bad. Likewise, for the 17-bay truss, we get 4.93, which we can say, well, that's pretty close to 5. So we'll say a 5-bay cantilever is close to optimal for 17 bays. If we jump over here um, and look at double cantilevers, we get 2.07 for 10, and so a two bay cantilever is not very far off. We know that we're looking for a 20.7% cantilever. Uh, two bay cantilevers and a 10 bay truss are 20%, which is pretty close to 20.7. Uh, Likewise, 2.9 is close to three. So for a 14 bay truss, we could have two three bay cantilevers and be close to optimal. And we keep that process going. The one we just looked at was a 24 bay truss. Uh, when we multiply 0.29 times 24, we get 6.96, which is very close to seven. So a 24 bay truss is kind of neat because a seven bay cantilever for a simple, for a single cantilever is pretty close to optimal. And five bays on each end as two, uh, as a cantilever on each end is very close to optimal. It's actually the optimum according to multiplying that that number times this number. The optimum is 4.97 which we're rounding to 5. So in other words these numbers corroborate what we just demonstrated in our solution which is that the um, two 5 bay cantilevers on a 24 bay truss is very close to optimum in terms of balancing the compressive forces in the top cord between the two supports versus the compressive forces over uh, in the bottom cord over the support. That ends our video on the analysis of a 24 square bay parallel cord truss with equal 5 bay cantilevers at each end.